balanced equations are symbolic representations of something that really happens, okay? It's a symbol representation of what's actually happening with atoms and compounds, or ions too, I guess. Um, and in order to um, explain what's happening with these equations, you also need to list the physical states of the formulas. Uh, the physical states are important because in this unit we'll eventually get to a point where you predict whether a reaction even can take place or not. And physical states are important in making that prediction. So yesterday when I gave you equations to practice for homework, I listed the formulas with physical states. But I want to tell you, make sure we're clear on what those physical state symbols mean. So the G's that we put in parentheses after some chemical formula means that that compound is a gas. And the L's we put in parentheses after a chemical formula means that that compound is a liquid. Now I would prefer that you use a script lowercase l. Capital L's mean something else and if you list just the one line lowercase l like you're printing an L, it's hard to tell if you're writing a capital I or the number one or an L. So if you'll use a script L, it'll make it a lot easier for everyone to be able to tell what you're trying to say. And we want to be as clear as we can. All right, Clarity is important in science writing or writing chemical equations. And I know that my handwriting is not always the best sometimes, but you know we want to try to do the best we can. All right, so S's we use to indicate if you have a solid. Um, I have seen textbooks where solids are listed as uh, lowercase cr, meaning a crystal. So there are crystalline solids, particularly when we have ionic compounds. <coughs> and in some cases, it's better to write it that way. We're not going to go that far. But I just want you to know in, in the, in, sometime in the future, you may come across cr as a physical state. That's basically for us just a solid. Okay? What? These are physical state symbols. And then AQ is very important to us because this is the symbol we use to indicate that, well, I shouldn't have put it in parentheses if I didn't put the others in there. But this means aqueous or dissolved in water. Now, a little bit later, uh, we're going to learn about something called a um, complete and net ionic equation. Um, and I'm going to kind of give you just a little bit of an introduction to it, but it's important that you understand, uh, since these chemical equations are actually symbolic representations of, what, of things that are really happening, it's important for you to understand a, a little bit, at least, about what is really happening. Okay? So, when we dissolve an ionic compound, those ionic compounds dissolve by breaking up into their separate ions. When we were learning to write ionic compounds, writing the formulas and the names, we had to figure out from the ionic charges how to balance the formula. What we're doing here is just simply undoing that process. Okay, so ionic compounds dissolve by breaking up separate ions. Okay. Um, let me give you a couple of examples here. Or actually, maybe three. We'll start out with something really, really simple. Here's table salt, sodium chloride. And we're going to start with the kind of table salt you have in a salt shaker. It's a solid, the white crystal we've looked at under those micro viewers. But when we put table salt in water, you all know, you have some practical experience with this. You know this breaks up, and do, but you don't know how it breaks up. You don't know how it dissolves. 
what I'm going to tell you now is that it breaks up into separate ions. So the sodium and chlorine ions break up into their separate ions. So we have a sodium ion, and it's going to be, and since it's, once it's in water and dissolved, that's aqueous. And we have a chloride ion, and that's going to be aqueous. Water, H2O. Mm -hmm. That's just a way of showing that I'm, um, what I'm doing is in water. I'm using water as part of the process. Water doesn't actually take, isn't actually taking part in the reaction, but it is part of the process. It's a way that it happens, okay? <coughs> now, something a little bit more complex might be so here's aluminum sulfate, it's an ionic compound. Remember, you can tell when you look at a formula that it's an ionic compound if it's a combination of metal and nonmetal, or if the formula contains a polyatomic ion. Okay? Remember, when you see a formula, if it has more than two elements, then one of the first things you want to do is look at the list of common ions that I gave you on your test references and see if there is a polyatomic ion in the formula. In this case, it's pretty straightforward. The only reason we put things in parentheses is when it, it, what is inside that parentheses is a polyatomic ion. So that's a clue right up front. You've got a polyatomic ion. The only reason to put something in parentheses in the formula is when you need to show more than one polyatomic ion. So you should already know when you look at this. That's got to be a polyatomic ion. S-O, sulfur oxygen. Oh, here? No, this is the solid state. The solid physical state symbol, S. When we break this up, we're going to break it up into aluminum and sulfate. But we need to know what the charges are on aluminum and sulfate. How do we figure out the charges on aluminum or the charge on aluminum? Look on the, not the common ions list. This is a single monoatomic ion the periodic table with oxidation numbers. Get out your test references and find and tell me <coughs> what charge to put on this aluminum, please. <coughs> what? Three plus. Please not look that up for yourself and make sure you can do this. You're going to need it in this unit. Okay? If you have a monoatomic ion, monoatomic means a single atom that has a plus or pl some kind of a plus charge or some kind of a negative charge. Monoatomic ions, you look on the periodic table for oxidation numbers and find the charge. What about this sulfate ion? What kind of charge do we put on that? That's a two negative. And where did you find that charge? Common ions list. Okay, since we identified this as a polyatomic ion, you've got to look for the on the common ions list to find the charge on the sulfate. All right. Now we need to know how many of each of these we're going to have when we split it up. Yeah. Got it. <coughs> got it. Okay. How many aluminums are there? Look here. Two aluminums. We have to show two aluminums here, or we're going to be violating the law of conservation of mass. We can't do that. How many sulfate ions do I have in this formula? Three sulfate ions. The sulfate itself has four oxygens. But this, there are three sulfate ions. So this three outside the parentheses is telling us we have three sulfate ions. Okay? And those are both now aqueous because they dissolved in water. All right? Okay, one more. Let's step it up as far as complexity just a little bit more now.
All right. We need to figure out what charge and what number of ions we need on this side. Can you do that? Hmm? Okay. So how are we going to break this up? Fe is one of them. What's the other part? <coughs> ClO3. Okay, what charge do we put on the Fe? Three. I hear twos and threes. How do we know which one to use? Okay, what we need to do is first figure out what charge makes this formula balance out. What charge is there on the chloride ion? One negative. Okay, how many chloride ions do I have? Three of them. How many iron ions do I have? Just one. So what we're going to do is all that math that we use to figure out how to balance formulas, we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to kind of undo everything, all right? So we know that we have an iron ion. We don't yet know. We're trying to figure out what charge to put on that iron ion. We know that we have one iron ion. And we're putting that iron ion together with three chloride ions. And yes, this, oops, you know what? I forgot the three here. Excuse me. Forgive me. Okay? If you, you can tell from my voice, I'm still not feeling well today. So I'm kind of fuzzy headed here a bit. Thanks for checking that out for me. Yep. What? We've got to figure out what the charge is because what we want is a neutral compound. This is a neutral compound. I didn't list any charges up here, so that means this charge on this is zero. It's neutral. So what we've got to do is figure out what charges to put on it. Well, right now we have one Fe, and we want to know what kind of charge that Fe has, right? And we're putting that together with these three chloride ions, and those chloride ions have a one negative charge. And when we figure out the charges here, we want the actual equation to equal zero. So now what we can do is say, well, what charge do I have to have here to make this work out? It has to be a three plus. Must be a three plus, can't be anything else but a three plus. Okay? So that means this is a three plus here, and this must be a three plus here. Okay? And our, and our physical state, because we dissolve this, is AQ. And I say what? Say if it was like, if FE or an ion number or whatever was like one plus, would you need three ions? Yes. But you wouldn't show the equation like this. I, I can see what your question is, but we wouldn't we wouldn't write the equation. We wouldn't write it Fe three ClO three three. Okay, if, if that were the case, it'd be just Fe ClO three. But having said that, iron does not have a one plus charge available. Okay, it has a two plus or a three plus charge. <coughs> okay. All right. Now, what we're gonna this is just kind of the beginning of the process of learning more about how uh, reactions actually occur. What I want to deal with today, most of the class period, is about classifying equations. Alright, and since we're kind of changing direction just a little bit, I'm going to give you a chance to um, stand up and stretch or get a drink of water or something if you want to. Let's take a short break.